Chapter 30, Abdominal and GIGU Injuries. As we all know, the abdomen is a pretty major body cavity and it contains a lot of important stuff. For example, the digestive and urinary and uh, genital urinary systems are located there. Significant trauma can be pretty serious in the abdominal cavity um, and it can be caused from blunt trauma penetrating or both. There are hollow organs, and then conversely, we'll talk about in a few moments, solid organs. Remember, the hollow organs contain digested food, urine, bile, and other chemicals that if they spill out into the peritoneal cavity or outside of their intended pathways can cause a lot of pain and discomfort and even infection. Intestinal blood supplies, the mesentery artery, uh, supplied from the mesentery, um, connects the smaller walls of the abdomen and then goes to the perineal cavity. Um, we can have major bleeding in the abdominal cavity and not really know um, until it's much too late for the patient. Here we go with our illustration of the abdominal cavity, uh, the contents. Notice the stomach, the gallbladder, the large and small intestine, the urinary bladder, and those are uh, often things that can be damaged in um, blunt trauma or blast injuries. In the illustration on the right, we see the, lar the uh, solid organs, the liver, the spleen, adrenal glands, etc., and those can be fractured or ruptured, or excuse me, fractured or broken during um, some types of trauma. We know that the solo organs have um, a pretty important job. They help clean the body systems, they're kind of the washing machines as we've mentioned before. Um, as such, uh, they're very vast, they're very rich in supply of blood and uh, when they're damaged, they can bleed a lot. So like many injuries and most trauma, uh, Injuries to the abdomen are considered open or closed, um, but we need to again think about what's inside, uh, what's underneath the skin. So blood force trauma, as we know, compression, uh, poorly placed seatbelt laps, being run over by a vehicle. Uh, I remember having a little girl um, on my first year with the fire department. Um, she had been run over by her father accidentally. Um, surprisingly, uh, she sustained very minor injuries uh, as a result. Um, we did fly her to uh, Mary Bridge Hospital. Uh, it just seemed to be the right thing to do for her. But uh, she was quite lucky. Uh, Dad ran over her with the car, oh, completely over the top of her, but only um, bumps and bruises, uh, how she fell under the wheels and such. So I was very, uh, very thankful for that. Um, fast moving, deceleration, strikes, falls from height. That's uh, the deceleration. Um, that what they say all the time, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop at the bottom. Uh, truly, that's that's what happens. You know, the deceleration injury is worse. So some of the signs that we see, uh, pain, obviously. Um, but it can be diffusing because often it's not, we're not really sure where it comes from. Um, like I said, you know, Abdominal pain can be very challenging to figure out. Now, often the pain is referred to another part of the body. Um, there could be blood in the perineal cavity. There could be acute pain in the entire abdomen. Um, we'll talk about distended abdomen uh, in just a few moments and what that means. So guarding or stiffening of the abdominal muscles, and that's where it gets distended. So it's true that um, we can fill up the abdomen with a lot of a lot of blood, but when we think about the size of the abdominal cavity and how much blood we have in our bodies, we really can't fill it all up with the patient still being conscious or awake. So what happens is when the blood reaches the tissue or touches it outside of its designated pathways, 
it irritates the muscles and they become hard and stiff. And that's where we get that abdominal distension. We can see bruising or discolorations. Uh, sometimes these take a while to come uh, to develop and other times, depending on the severity of the injury, uh, they can be uh, almost immediate. If you see a dark purple colored bruise, um, your index of suspicion should uh, increase quite a bit because that was a significant force that created that. Uh, bruising in, in uh, yellow or paler colors, um, that bruising, that bleeding has been there for some time and actually is starting to get better and diffuse. Seatbelts and motor vehicle collisions can cause some um, significant uh, injury, but I think they, uh, they certainly prevent more injuries than they can cause. But some of the injuries, uh, particularly as it mentions in that last bullet point, can cause bladder injuries in pregnant women, um, or sometimes people who have been drinking a lot and their bladders are full, they get in a car crash, uh, their um, bladder can actually rupture as a result of that. Here's a good illustration of how we want to properly place, notice the position in the, in the lower uh, uh, illustration there. Uh, that's how we want to place our lap and our uh, shoulder belt. And then of course our lap belt would go over the iliac crest um, to give us the maximum support and protection from the seatbelt. Anything that's incorrectly placed, sometimes people will put their arm around it or they'll lay it, uh, put it down low uh, on them. Uh, that could cause damage and injury. So open abdominal wounds, penetrating wounds can be caused from a various, a variety of uh, different reasons from, you know, a screwdriver being accidentally stuffed into a person, um, knife wounds, bullet wounds, uh, arrows. Uh, you're working in the shop and a piece of metal comes up and slides into you, all kinds of things. Um, they can be really deceiving also because um, the entrance wound might be just really small. Um, the What it does on the inside. So remembering a, a few lectures back when we talked about overall trauma and we talked about um, velocity of the penetration. So low velocity um, can cause more of a predictable pattern um, in the in the patient as a knife goes in. Um, unless it's twisted and moved around, it pretty much has a pathway in and then it comes out. Medium velocity, small caliber handguns, uh, 22 shotguns, uh, those kind of things. They they do a little bit more. They do quite a bit more damage, but as compared to a high velocity weapon, they don't do as much damage. Um, Remember the bullet goes in, it could hit a piece of bone. Um, depending on how the projectile is designed, it could tumble, it could mushroom, it could fragment. Um, and the thing that, to think about with shotguns, depending on the caliber of the shotgun and the, the load of the uh, shell itself and how many pellets that may be within it. Uh, for example, double out buck uh, shotgun uh, shells have 10 to 12 30 caliber pellets in each one of them so that's like getting shot you know 10 times with a 38 caliber uh, revolver uh, essentially it's a 30 caliber weapon um, high velocity high powered rifles that's your um, and high uh, high powered handguns uh, The higher to medium velocity, they leave a, a temporary channel um, caused by the cavitation it goes through. Um, the entrance wound may be small, um, but it can cause some damage as it squishes and, and um, expands inside um, a person and then compresses the tissue on the inside. Um, uh, <clears throat> evisceration of the bowel, this is, I, fortunately I have not seen this in my career. Um, I do remember uh, we had to watch a video and we, uh, they interviewed a former Los Angeles County firefighter. It was a common practice back in the uh, 80s and uh, early 90s um, until this event happened for a firefighter when they were backing the vehicle into the station to actually ride on the tailboard um, as they're backing into the station. And this one uh, firefighter, she was on the tailboard 
she was backing the driver in and she slipped off and he didn't see her and ran over her with the fire engine. In the um, interview on the video that we watched uh, in, while I was in fire academy, they, she talked about being drugged between the duels of the back wheels and um, grabbing her bowels and trying to shove them back in as uh, they were, her abdomen was popping open. And I, I just never forgot that. So as it says there in the second bullet point, do not push down on the abdomen. If you see uh, bowels sticking out, just wrap them with a moist sterile dressing and leave them just like that. We'll see an illustration in a few minutes of, of what that could look like. Obviously, the patient's probably going to be tachycardic. And you can imagine if you're still awake and you're able to see this, uh, it's going to cause you to be in a, you're going to be a shock for sure. Um, and look for um, distended abdomen and others. All the organs uh, can spill their contents into the rest of the abdomen. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, remember, the stomach is filled with um, acidic fluid and it's highly toxic when it's inside the person. And both blunt and penetrating traumas can cause injuries to the hollow organs, um, as it says here. And one of the things we want to be concerned about is right here, uh, we want to make sure that um, we're doing everything we can to prevent uh, septic shock from developing, but the potential is yeah, very high. <clears throat> the solid organ, uh, again, is filled with uh, lots and lots of blood and thereby it can bleed a lot. Um, so how do we know if it's bleeding a lot? We can look for during our assessment, we can check for rigidity, we can check for uh, signs and presence of shock. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't bleed out really fast. It, it bleeds out slowly as it, as it mentions in your book. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. And then remembering the mechanism of injury and where we see in the patients complaining of pain can also give us an idea of what structures may be damaged underneath the skin. The spleen, pancreas, they're also prone to heavy bleeding. Um, it is possible to survive without these. There's medications that help uh, people uh, live without their pancreas. For example, they could take insulin. Uh, remember that insulin is produced in, in, the, uh, in the pancreas. And so uh, severe injury to the pancreas can result in a otherwise previously healthy uh, person uh, now having uh, being insulin dependent diabetic. And then of course the diaphragm, if it's uh, ruptured or uh, has penetrating trauma around it, um, it can cause some significant breathing compromise uh, because it is the organ, the major muscle that controls our, uh, or uh, provides for our respiration. <clears throat> Kidneys, uh, in the lateral uh, back of the uh, patient, that's where we find our kidneys on the back side. So if the patient is complaining of uh, pain in their, um, in their left or right side and flanks, and then uh, blood in their urine, we might um, be concerned about the possibility of a kidney injury. So as with all of our patients, we do an assessment. Um, sometimes as it said, you know, as it mentions, it's kind of difficult. Um, the abdomen is very diffuse and it's hard to pinpoint particularly what, what it is. And we have to look for other injuries that the patient might have. So some of these injuries uh, seem to be non-life-threatening threatening, and yet don't get tunnel vision because they can um, worsen over time, uh, making our patient, uh, before we get to the hospital, a critical patient, which otherwise may have been BLS when we first arrived on scene. So constant reassessment, that's where we're doing our, our rechecks every at least every five minutes. So make sure it's safe for us. Look around the scene. What is the scene telling us about the possible me uh, mechanism of injury and how does that affect our index of suspicion? Do our rapid trauma assessment. Remember, find and fix immediate life threats. Form our general impression. 
right away? Is there something that we have to do right now to save, to change the outcome uh, out, uh, of this patient? Or do we have time? Don't be distracted by an injury that is visually impressive and fail to look for a hidden injury that could be potentially life-threatening. ABCs, circulation, treat for aggressive shock. Remember supine, blanket, high flow oxygen, transport. Do the best that we can to provide a sample history. Find out if the patient is experiencing nausea or vomiting. Find out if they are complaining of thirst. Those are all um, indications or potential indications that the person could be having some um, in, internal bleeding. Then we do our secondary. We make sure we do our systematic assessment from top to bottom, perform a full body scan, stop and treat any life, new life-threatening uh, threats that we might meet um, that we did not find in our rapid trauma. That's where we do our vital signs. We make our transport decision. We should have already had a pretty good idea about our transport decision. Treat patients aggressively for a shock, cover their wounds, do our best to control bleeding, transport to the hospital, reassess, make sure everything that we're doing is working. <clears throat> With closed abdominal injuries, this is a bit more challenging because, again, I mean, if it's an open injury, we can see there is a hole. We have a suspicion that those things that, you know, the liver, or the spleen, or the large intestine might be involved. But with a closed uh, abdominal injury, we have to kind of look at the patient, read uh, what the skin signs are telling us, any bruising that might be there, et cetera. <clears throat> but notice the treatment, aside from controlling the bleeding, is pretty much the same. You know, treat for the shock, transport them to the hospital. Consider spinal mobilization if it's necessary, depending on uh, what's going on for a patient. Um, dry sterile dressing um, should be used on any uh, abdominal wound unless there is um, an event. So in this illustration, we see, um, in this picture, we see uh, an, an, abdom uh, an abdominal evisceration. And first of all, this is, my understanding, this is make-believe and, and fake. And, and they, But you can see how they've done it. We don't want to push any of that back in, cover it. You want to moisten the dressing because this stuff lives in a moist environment. So sterile saline only. Um, you don't have to soak it. Um, just get it moist and, you know, wring it out if you need to and cover it up. Lint-free if possible. So this is where uh, the um, old burn sheets or abdominal pads that are lint-free, um, they work really well for um, any kind of evisceration. I think we beat this up a little bit. Don't put the stuff back in. We don't know where it goes for sure. Um, cover it up, take them to. So, <clears throat> the uh, genital urinary system, as most of us know, this controls the organs that are um, the functions of waste and discharge. Um, it's located in the abdomen, it involves our kidneys, ureters, bladder, urethra. The male genitalia lies outside the pelvic cavity and the female genitalia is within the pelvic cavity. Each one of these systems can kind of have its own issue in the presence of trauma. It's an illustration of how, uh, where things are located uh, for the, the male genitalia, and conversely for the female genitalia. You can see how the female genitalia is uh, well protected inside, whereas the male genitalia is exposed to um, trauma from the outside.
So that is a potential injury. And I mentioned that only because that can happen. You know, somebody falls, um, they broke their leg and it's visually stimulating, but let's make sure we check out the rest of the body. So some of the injuries, we could have penetrating uh, wounds in, the re in that region. And any times there's a hole that goes into the body that kind of almost makes it easier for us to find the injury spot, but don't forget to look around. Um, those of you who are in the class who are have been or going through uh, the fire academy or have been in the fire service before when you're in search and rescue and you find a person, you have to do a 360 around that person to make sure that they're not alone. Um, kind of the same thing when we find a penetrating injury in our patient. We gotta check around the rest of the body to make sure that that injury isn't all by itself. <clears throat> the bladder can rupture, especially if it's uh, full. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier, um, often with uh, your pregnant patient, uh, one of the complaints that they have is they always have to go to the bathroom. Um, part of that's the pregnancy is sitting on top of the, the urinary bladder, which is creating that, that feeling. Um, and then uh, patients who have been intoxicated or have been, maybe they're not even intoxicated, they've been drinking, um, or they drink a lot of water, then um, our urine, our uh, urinary bladder fills up quicker. And if it's full and we crash, um, it, can, it can actually rupture. So, and you can see from this uh, illustration here, how a piece of bone fragment might go through the bladder if the part of the pelvis is broken. You can see there, the lower part of the pelvis where it might've run in. And now we have um, urine spilling out into the, into the body cavity where it doesn't belong. And that's going to be uncomfortable for your patient. So the male genitalia is, uh, is particularly susceptible to um, soft tissue injuries, um, lacerations, eviscerations, um, uh, amputations, uh, um, various things that could happen. Um, so, and I've seen, unfortunately, a few of these where um, the scrotal sac has been ripped open and the testicles are hanging out. Um, so we wrap them in a sterile dressing and we take the patient to the hospital. Female genitalia uh, can also be um, damaged uh, with trauma. Um, there's the you know bicycle accident, you fall, you hit the, the crossbar on the bicycle, it can cause a um, significant amount of uh, injury to uh, the female genitalia also. Um, <clears throat> and if the patient is pregnant, um, shearing injuries, falls, crashes, that kind of stuff can cause significant damage uh, to the, uh, the fetus or the uterus as it's moving around. So the female genitalia um, is also very um, rich in nerve supply. It's very rich in blood supply. And um, we also have to consider the possibility of sexual assault in pregnancy uh, anytime we see injuries to the female genitalia. So no matter how bad the bleeding may be vaginally, we never, ever, ever insert anything or pack uh, our patient's vagina. <clears throat> Always maintain a professional appearance and professional presence. If there's injury to genitalia, people are very sensitive about it. So if possible, try to have an EMT of the same gender, if possible, and if that's not possible, be grown-ups. Somebody is in pain. Somebody has been severely injured. But we need to treat them as such. Do our scene safety like we would with all of our...
don't avoid this area in our, our rapid assessment. As we're looking at our patients on any type of trauma call, where especially where we have multi-systems involved, make sure that we are checking the perineum. Make sure we're checking the genitalia. We got to make sure that the patient isn't exhibiting any bleeding or signs of um, spinal shock, uh, which is evidenced in a male by, by a priapism, and then uh, which is an erection caused by pooling of blood, and then in a female, um, engorged labia and uh, other genitalia that is um, abnormal for the patient. And then make our transport decisions, transport them to specialty care uh, if we need to, um, or whatever your local program. Do our best to do history taking with anybody. Um, find out when they ate last. Uh, depending on the the potential injury in the uh, abdomen and GI tract um, and uh, GU tract, we that patient might wind up in surgery, and it's important if the hospital at least knows that they've been eating. Do our secondary like we would for any other patient. Reassess, 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 and then document the, your findings. <clears throat> Kindy injuries, um, as we said, sometimes they don't, uh, they're not obvious. Um, we can have our index of suspicion, which might point us that direction, but look for things um, such as blood and urine, um, and treat for shock. If we suspect that the patient has um, a urinary bladder uh, injury, some of the things you might look for is again, uh, blood at the uh, at the urethra, uh, signs of trauma, um, pelvis in the perineum, and those areas as soon as we can. With the uh, male genitalia, um, we can use a sterile moist compress to cover the areas that are stripped of skin. For example, the, uh, uh, the example that I showed you, uh, I told you of the call I went on where the gentleman he slipped in the shower, uh, a tub and shower, fell on the tub part and ripped open his scrotum. And so a moist compress, uh, and then he was able to hold it himself on the way to the hospital. Bleeding was controlled, and so we took him to the hospital. Um, do our best. Uh, if there's uh, amputations to uh, <clears throat> manage any of the, the parts, bring them with you. If you can, um, dress in and bandage the wound. Uh, fractured penis is also a thing that can happen. If the patient uh, had an erection uh, at the time of injury, they can actually, and it appears to be fractured. So we need to, uh, again, maintain professional presence and. Um, transport the patient to the hospital. <clears throat> sometimes the bleeding is heavy, sometimes it's not. Um, we've heard of uh, many of these different uh, types of injuries that are illustrated here, being caught in a zipper, parts of it being caught in a zipper. It is a soft tissue injury and it needs to be treated as such. Um, again, maintaining professional presence. Talked about tra uh, straddle injuries. Um, if the patient can urinate, and uh, it's important to know if there's blood in the urine. Uh, it's a, uh, information that we can back here. Direct blows to the scrotum can result in rupture of the testicles. Uh, there can be um, uh, testicular torsion uh, where the testicle actually twists on itself. Um, these are considered medical emergencies. Uh, just like uh, the possible loss of an arm or you know uh, an eye or something like that, um, and should be treated as as a pretty serious injury. Um, take the patient to the hospital and do the best that we can um, to uh, put them in the position of comfort. <clears throat> With uh, female genitalia, um, they can also have, suffer from or suffer significant injury. So we use uh, local dressing. Um, we can uh, 
make like a diaper type. Actually, one of the best things to use would be like a sanitary napkin um, if it's available. Again, don't put anything inside. So a tampon would not be the, the proper dressing for us to use, but a sanitary napkin or a big uh, trauma pad um, to help control the bleeding. If there are any foreign objects um, in the vagina, we want to leave them there and let the hospital take them out. Um, and we transport them. Again, this could be a pretty significant serious injury. Uh, so we want to make sure that we treat it as such. It, um, some of these injuries are life-threatening or are painful, but not life-threatening. And some of them are potentially life-threatening. Bleed. Rectal bleeding. Uh, we've talked about this um, on the medical side. Uh, rectal bleeding can also be a complication of trauma, uh, whether it's uh, uh, induced by sexual assault or foreign bodies um, being inserted in the rectum, hemorrhoids, uh, colitis, uh, ulcers, etc. cetera. Um, and we need to be cognizant of that also. Don't examine the genitalia unless obvious bleeding requires application of the dressing. It is very important that we do not contaminate the area. Don't let your patient change. Don't let them take a shower. Don't let them clean themselves. And when you take them to the hospital, make sure that you uh, advise the receiving facility that they need a sane sexual assault nurse examiner and that you have a potential sexual assault patient. Um, that way they can do the exams and all that kind of stuff. If for some reason their clothes are, are uh, removed or torn, um, again, this is a law enforcement issue at that point, but if you're there, make sure that, uh, and, and law enforcement isn't there, uh, place things in a paper sack. Follow your normal crime scene policies, uh, advise, the patient, as we said, not to wash, bathe, don't go to the bathroom, or anything like that, um, and provide for their emotional support and reassurance. As I said, sexual assault will be one of the most challenging calls that you will ever go on. This will be a call where it will draw on your inner strength, not to be judgmental to anybody involved, patients, bystanders, anyone, to be 100% professional, and I know that all of you can do that. That concludes our uh, lecture for Chapter 30.